All right, so this set of notes ties to section two, chapter five. The first section introduced biodiversity and we talked about its importance and value. And second section here gets into what are some of the threats to biodiversity. If you look at the pictures on this page of these animals, they all have something in common. If you're not aware, the Tasmanian tiger, the dodo bird, Triceratops, and the passenger pigeon are all extinct animals. So what is extinction? Well, that means the loss of a species that's living on Earth forever. And so if you're losing species, you're losing biodiversity. Chapter 5, page 123 has a table that talks about or outlines the estimated number of extinctions since 1600 of mammals, birds, reptiles, and so on. And uh, so if you're curious which creatures are on the decline at a faster rate, you need to check that out. But one thing to note about Earth is that things have always gone extinct. There is something known as background extinction. And a competitive world and ecosystems, some species fare better than others, have better adaptations than others, and so some survive well, and some populations go by the wayside, become extinct. So on Earth's history, with natural selection, extinction is something that occurs at a somewhat predictable rate. Mass extinction, on the other hand, is when it's defined, I believe, as when 90 or 95% of all the species that existed on Earth have died off. <clears throat> so background extinction versus mass extinction. Large percentage of species become extinct in a relatively short period of time. Of course, we're thinking geologic time, but um, nonetheless, pretty quickly. And the fossil record gives us clues to five historic mass extinctions, one of which led to the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And today, we are losing species at a thousand times faster than normal background extinction would occur, which tells us that we're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. And the only difference between those mass extinctions and today's mass extinction is the existence of humans. Humans weren't around for the other five, but we are currently present and largely responsible for this current mass extinction. So the text outlines five threats to biodiversity. And I've highlighted two on this list that I think probably have the greatest impact or maybe link or tie to the other ones. Habitat loss and pollution. But they all get mentioned and they all get defined. So what is overexploitation? Anytime we excessively use a species that has economic value, and acts as a habitat disturbance. One very well-known example of overexploitation and harvesting a species that has economic value. Um, historically, the bison in North America and the beaver in North America. So habitat loss is the number one threat to biodiversity. So what does habitat loss mean? Well, we can talk about habitat destruction versus habitat disruption. They kind of are similar. One is just more severe in losing habitat. So habitat destruction would be when an entire habitat is removed and replaced with something else. For example, in a clear wetland or um, 
clear or plow up the ground and grow crops rather than um, letting the prairie be the prairie, for example. That would be habitat destruction, deforestation, clear cutting the forest for timber and then raising crops there instead of cutting forest. So this is just an image of habitat destruction when you just clear cut an area transform the landscape to something completely different from what it naturally was. So this cornfield is what's known as a monoculture. You're growing one type of thing predominantly. Of course, there's some weeds scattered in there, but generally one thing growing there compared to what was there. So this has very low biodiversity compared to what was there. Habitat disruption is a little more subtle. So this is when something changes or in that habitat or in that area. Maybe it's a loss of a species or two or a reduction in a particular population that impacts the whole habitat or the whole ecosystem. And that gets us to the idea of keystone species. So when we got rid of beaver and the way that they landscape and drain and manage wetlands naturally, we changed the dynamics of a lot of ecosystems, which changed what plants were growing and had an impact actually on the elk population out west and had an impact on then the predator species like wolves. And so when we lose something like the beaver, we are losing a keystone species and it's having major disruption on the environment as a whole. So that's habitat disruption. You're not clear cutting it, but you are changing the dynamics of how it normally functioned. And a major disruption today to habitats would be climate change, which we are responsible for. So beaver example of a keystone species. All right, habitat fragmentation, considered a habitat disturbance. So when we do make many changes to areas through development, changing the land for our use, we sometimes keep pockets of ecosystems, but the pieces of whole ecosystem that they might live in um, are fewer and fewer. And so there are some bird species for example, that live in the interiors of forest, but will not live close to the edges. And so if we keep making the habitat fragments smaller and smaller, then some species won't continue to live there, like this oven bird up on the right. Um, and so some species will again fare well with habitat fragmentation, and some like the oven bird here will probably disappear if the fragments get too small. So this is how we define habitat fragmentation. Then uh, this is what I was just mentioning, edge effects. Habitats bordering roads, for example, experience different abiotic factors than the interiors of a forest, for example. The wind, humidity, temperature can actually be enough different on the interior of a forest versus the edge to, again, make it not suitable for some species of plants and animals to survive well. So the bottom line is smaller fragments of habitat support smaller populations. And that gets us to populations that have less genetic biodiversity. We talked about that with the cheetahs. So low genetic diversity results in populations being less able to adapt to environmental changes. And because of the way we set these fragments up, there's not always a way for species to move back and forth to different fragments. Um, yes, birds can migrate, but a lot of species would have to go across unsuitable habitat to get to the next fragment to find a mate, for example. Pollution is a biggie. And that changes, any, we define it as any time we change the composition of air, soil, and or water, 
in a way that makes it unsuitable or damaging to life. So we learned in Rachel Carson about pesticides and the effects on the Western grebes and the fish, like this northern and biological magnification. So I think chemical pollution of our water is one of the biggies passing things through the food chains. And being amplified in those larger or higher level organisms on the food chain. So if you can't remember what biological magnification is, just check out this diagram. So these pluses are pollutants. And you can see the grasses have a little bit of pollutant in them. The mouse eats a lot of grass. And so it starts to accumulate more pluses or toxins. And the snake eats a bunch of mice to survive, so it's going to have even more accumulated toxins built up. And then by the time you get to the hawk, which has to eat a lot of snakes and possibly mice, they're going to have even more toxins concentrated in their tissues. So that's, again, a concept that as you move up a food chain, concentrations of pollutants get more and more concentrated. And so the higher level of organisms on a food chain are most impacted. And that's really important for us because we eat higher up on the food chain. Other pollutions, um, if we talk about air, we can talk about acid precipitation from a lot of our exhausts and things that we burn result in changing the chemistry of the air, which then changes uh, to deposits of precipitation that are acidic and actually can destroy life. So one of the main culprits of acid precipitation just comes out of our tailpipes. And we have technology that can improve those emissions and filter a lot of that. But... but this forest here is a result of acid precipitation. In the U.S., a lot of our discovery of acid pollution and its effects on living things was noted by the steel industry and all of the um, industry happening in the northeast part of the United States. All of those emissions were resulting in a lot of acid precipitation and whole ecosystems were dying off from it. We've since made adjustments and improved the situation in a lot of places, but it is one of those things that we've had to contend with. And you destroy whole ecosystems, you destroy biodiversity in that area. Eutrophication is another type of pollution, and that comes when we reduce things like phosphates and nitrates in excess on the land, and then that from the land it runs off into our waterways and waterways become too nutrient rich and causes algae blooms which actually are pollutants in themselves they lead to dead zones and low oxygen level in our lakes and waters and oceans and so you can read about the dead zone in the gulf of mexico as a result of all of the excess nutrients that have gone down the Mississippi into the Gulf of Mexico and the eutrophication that comes from that. So when you see a lake in Minnesota at the end of the season and it looks like pea soup, that's because of eutrophication. And that's what it looks like. Not fun to swim in. And can lead to fish kills because of that low oxygen level. And then, of course, introduced species are also a habitat disturbance. And this is why they're a problem. They don't have natural checks and balances when they're introduced to their new habitat. And so they can often outcompete native species and then reduce the number of native species. So there's emerald ash borer, zebra mussels, and buckthorn as examples. And that's the end of the. Thank you.